So what are you going to do with these other two chocolate eggs? Chocolate in my mouth right now? You're wondering if I would put these chocolate eggs in your mouth right now? Yes. Do you know who's on my podcast this week? Nope. Would you like to know? I would like to know. His name is George Colligan. I've never heard of him. Well, that's why I had him on the podcast, so we could get to know him. Do you, do you know what he plays? Piano, trumpet, trumpet, and drums. Did you know about him before you met him? I did know about him before I met him. I met him after I had heard him play on a record. Do you know what the record was called? The New York Flamenco Reunion. <laughs> Doesn't sound like that a good... is silly to me. Why? <laughs> because. But you know, you know, he used to live in Brooklyn for a long time. But he doesn't live here anymore. Do you want to know where he lives now? No? How about if I give you a chocolate egg? Would you like to know then? Yes. Where does he live? Portland, Oregon. <laughs> it's a hipster city. Are you sure? It's pretty hip. So we talked about a lot of things. You know what else he does? Stand-up comedy. Comedian. What does that mean? Tells jokes. Oh. <laughs> Do you know any jokes? Oh, uh, yeah. I know a gay one. Okay. Back now. Who's there? Interrupting guy. Interrupting guy? No! <laughs> <laughs> Should we say anything else about George Colligan? <laughs> was it an interesting conversation? It was an interesting conversation. It was very interesting. But you know what's crazy? After the interview was over, we went out for lunch, and we had an incredible conversation after our official podcast conversation was over, and... He, of course, said all kinds of things that I wish I had recorded in our conversation. Like what? Well, one thing that he said that I thought was interesting was he was a sideman for a long time for a lot of very important jazz musicians. A sideman means he played in their band. And I asked him, what made you such a good sideman? Uh, I'm ma- bored of this. I oh. really am. Well, okay. Here's some chocolate. And here's my conversation with George Colligan. That was weird. Man, do you remember the first time we met? In Spain? I think we met first at a baggage carousel in Japan. That, oh, that, right, right, right. I remember <laughs> saying to you, I, man, I love you so much. And you said, where did you hear me? <laughs> and I said, the New York Flamenco Reunion, which oh, I yeah, think yeah. was like probably an unexpected answer. Right, right. But I have been... Always, since I first heard it, completely obsessed with that record, man. Oh, wow. Thank you. And it just floored me when I first heard it. And I've talked to everybody on the record about it at some point. Mm-hmm. I mean, not on the podcast, but I've I've, I've talked to all, all of you. And I get the sense from it that it was just this like moment in time, this brief thing that just happened. Mm-hmm. And to me, I think that you played on like the kind of blue of flamenco jazz. You wow. Know? That is a the, high compliment. It just is definitive to me that one. Wow! Thank you very much. Maybe history history will help solidify that yeah. notion. <laughs> you know what's funny about that time that you're saying that we first met because I remember that was a tour I was doing with Shunzo Ono, the trumpet player. Uh-huh. It was one of the few times I don't always get to be in business class, but because of the nature of this tour, it was sponsored by a, a group called Minon, which is related to the the Buddhist organization over there, Soka Gakkai. Uh-huh. And so they have a lot of money, or at least they did at that time. And so it was a very, very cushy tour, one of the cushiest tours uh, to this day that I've done. It was just unbelievable. The Everything was top notch you know even the per diem was just yeah. like outrageous you know i couldn't believe it you know but i remember seeing your father yeah i, I was sure but i wasn't quite sure i was like i think yeah i think that's ben sidron uh, and and um yeah just sort of walking by him getting up to go to the bathroom on on the on the plane and 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 i so so when we got to baggage claim yeah. i was like uh, i said to our our bass player ed howard i said I'm pretty sure that's Ben Sidron, but I, I don't really know him. Yeah. And he was like, oh, let's find out. He's like, Ben, <laughs> Ben, Ben. <laughs> I was like, Ed, you're stupid. And he turned. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so then he came over, he said hello, and, you know, you guys were touring, and, you know, we were well, We were just landing, yeah. I remember I remember that, you know, that stupor that you're in when you get off a long flight. And yeah. I love that your memory of that is related to flying in business class because it, it sort of speaks mm-hmm. to the life, which is, you know, you might not remember every gig you play, but you may remember the meal or the transportation or the bread or something Absolutely. around it. Because now, I mean, 
it's it's more rare everything's more expensive but yeah. um at that time and and of course to to be business class going to japan is a whole other experience you know because there's it just built into the japanese culture is uh this hospitality yeah you know so you just feel like a king you know whereas now you fly and you're you feel like you're lucky they don't haul you off to jail when we're going into security you know i i haven't ever asked anybody about this like officially but i i have had mixed feelings about performing in japan sometimes hmm, really i've always felt really well taken care of yeah but slightly removed from the audiences and and not really sure if there's real communication happening between the audiences from yeah, the stage. I see what you mean. Yeah, and I mean, and I, and it's interesting because we're focusing on one particular country, but I think you have to because who who has supported touring jazz musicians? I mean, yeah. historically, it's been Europe, which is obviously many different co- yeah. countries and cultures. But it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, I'm going to Europe, right? You know. Uh, or Japan, which is a singular sovereign nation with a, a you know a pretty homogeneous uh, culture. Totally. So playing for Japanese people, I would say for me, I, I, because I'm usually in a better mood because I'm treated so well. Even the I'd say the worst tours that I've done in Japan, still there's a there's certain level of appreciation and just organization mm-hmm. and and hospitality that occurs and so you're like oh i've had a nice meal Uh, getting here wasn't such a big deal like the piano is in tune it's a Mm -hmm. nice piano everything the sound is good and the people are listening and quiet and that's good now they are so quiet that's the part that you sort of wonder like are hello (laughs) is anybody here you know um i heard this story uh, about the beatles i'm not sure i don't have it in writing, but I just I remember hearing this or reading it somewhere that uh, when they were doing their period of touring, which was not long, mm-hmm. but in the 60s, you know, early 60s, and they were touring the States and, you know, the whole phenomenon of screaming girls they in couldn't these even big states, couldn't yeah. hear themselves at all. And they, they were like, boy, this is a bummer. And so what I heard is that when they went to Japan, it was not that, that the people were really quiet. So they were like, wow, we can finally hear ourselves. And then they said, wow, we don't sound very good. <laughs> and that That's kind of interesting, you know. That may be part of what I experience, which is that you're so much under a microscope in that condition that you are confronted with yourself on a level that you're not a lot of times in the kind of club environments that a lot of times we play in. Absolutely. I definitely know some musicians who only played not even clubs, but just restaurant gigs yeah. or, or hotel gigs, background gigs. There's one bass player from Baltimore, I remember, um, named Larry Kinling, who we had him play a concert with us at Peabody. I went to Peabody uh, for my undergrad, and he was just freaked out. He was like, oh, people are listening. He wasn't used to it at all. And that's an unbelievable thing when you think about it. You could have an entire career or the majority of your career and and actually never play for a listening room. Yeah. And be a working musician. Yeah, it is interesting. There's so many different ways to make a living in this business. I mean, like, you know, and some, some people are fortunate to just do concerts, you know, sure. and never play in a restaurant, you know. Well, you, but, you have kind of returned in recent years to the kind of restaurant scene, right? I mean, you, yes. when you moved to, to, from New York to Portland, you were confronted with a new kind of jazz scene. Yes. I, yeah, that's, you, it's interesting how you're looking at that. And, and I will say this, that um, Portland is a small-time scene. It is not New York, you know. Sorry, Portlanders. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it, it's... And it never will be, you know. New York is still... I remember when I played with Benny Golson, he made this big point of saying, like, jazz, New York is our mecca, Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, at the time, this was a long time ago, I was thinking, like, does it have to be? Mm -hmm. Could there not be... You know, because there was a time when Chicago was really the scene. Yes. But could could another place exist that would draw a whole bunch of jazz musicians, it would be a really thriving scene. I mean, New York is still, by default, the mecca because there's so many cats here and there are more places to play. Now, it's tougher than ever, yep. you know, to, to get a gig and to make a living here. But still, if people want to experience it on the highest level, they come here. They don't go to Portland. They might go to Chicago. Chicago has a pretty good scene. But I it's not. It's, a great scene. it's still not New York. Yeah. I mean, Berlin, still not New York. 
so in Portland, there are some good musicians, like anywhere else. Yep. You know, every place has a handful of cats that are good. And I think maybe in the 80s, 70s and 80s, there there was a scene like there was everywhere else. You know, there was just more live music in general. Portland, I, when I moved there, I kind of had this idea like this could be not necessarily a jazz mecca, but it could be some kind of alternative, you know, cheaper to live, some venues, some good players, some enthusiasm, you know, and it has this kind of more crunchy, organic thing. It's yep. liberal. It's people who are interested in the arts. Um, and to be quite honest, it seemed that way when I got there and I was going out a lot and I was trying to really become ensconced in the mm -hmm. scene. But for a variety of unknown reasons, a bunch of places, like maybe 10 places, huh. closed within uh, six months to a year. Closed or stopped having jazz. And that was very discouraging. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, and it even continues. We, we lost uh, the biggest, re really the only full-time jazz club in the city, Jimmy Max. Yeah. They closed. I mean, um, a lot of that was because the owner... Uh, had cancer. He died the day after they closed. So mm -hmm. it's it's somewhat tragic. Now the thing is, you're sort of faced with the concept of well, I want to I want to play. Yeah. I need, I need to play. Like for me, I, I have a teaching position in, at Portland State, and um, and you have tenure. I have tenure. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And I um, I, I I enjoy teaching. You know, there are frustrations with teaching, but I. In some ways, I feel like um, I've embraced, now that I'm older, I've embraced the, the duty to pass on knowledge that I have. I mean, I'm not an, a, an old grandmaster or anything, but, you know, I have some experience and I've played with a lot of different people. I've done a lot of different things and I have enough knowledge and experience to pass on to a younger generation, you know, as it was passed on to me. Yes. So I embrace that. And that's more of my mission rather than like, grades and and you know that that type of stuff is not really that important to me or or yeah sort of um pedagogy well uh, yeah there there has to be because yeah. it's a university there yeah. has to be pedagogy but you can have your curriculum you can have things on paper you can have sort of this class outline but at the same time that's not how i learned the music that's what i'm thinking and what i think is so interesting about your background is that you know you're known still primarily as a piano player mm -hmm. and you did go to music school but you didn't go to music school as a piano player not at all no i i was a classical trumpet major i i played trumpet from fourth grade all through college and and i identified as a trumpeter um when i went to school which was peabody conservatory in, in um baltimore maryland so you have a relationship with a conservatory and how musical training is passed down in, in a more formal way. Absolutely. But Absolutely. you also came to jazz this sort of old-fashioned way. Right in the streets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but, you know, that is that is really the case. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, um, I would say the way I learned is, well, first of all, I got interested in listening to records, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't have a huge record collection because nobody did. You know, I mean, you, you, well, maybe some people did, but like my parents were not musicians, so I had to rely on some records that neighbors gave me, gave me like a whole stack of records. Huh. And and then um, what listening was, to what the, was in the stack? I'll tell you. It, it was um, Milestones, Miles Davis. It was Dizzy Gillespie, New Wave. It was um, Clifford Brown, Max Roach, mm -hmm. uh, the re whatever the record is with Joy Spring on mm -hmm. it. A record called Art Farmer and... Donald Byrd, Trumpets All Out. So you heard a lot of trumpet, and as a trumpet player, that that's, probably opened you up. See what I'm up. saying? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I identified as a trumpet player, and I wanted to, and I, and I really loved Wynton Marsalis, uh -huh. as everyone did in the early 80s. They were like, oh, this is, and especially somebody who played classical and jazz. That was, you know, Wynton can be a controversial figure, but I would have to credit him with a certain amount of inspiration for sure. We can now know a little bit more about whether Wynton Marsalis is a part of history. And I think he is. I mean, I think he may be a minor figure, but hmm. he may be, you know, this might sound really bizarre, but you could, there are similarities in some ways between, historically, between Wynton Marsalis and Al Hurt, not hmm. just because they're both from New Orleans, yeah. but because they are both related to revival movements, mm -hmm. you know, like, 
the revival of Dixieland in the 1950s is a mere footnote. Yes. It's not going to be a whole chapter. It's going to be like, oh, and then it, it may be tacked on to a chapter about Dixieland or, or early jazz or whatever. It's sort of be like, oh, and then in the 50s, there was a brief, brief revival. Right. You know, that, that also combined a different, like the more modern rhythm section concept right. with uh, people playing in that older style. It was a young dude who, yeah. who was playing classical music on the highest level. Yeah. And playing jazz on the highest level, yeah. and playing, you know, playing with Art Blakey and playing with Herbie Hancock, yeah. and, and they just happen to have a lot of money to put behind it. But the context is really fascinating to me. And again, I'd like to see if I'm around in twenty, thirty years to see what I mean, and if Winton's still around. Yeah. But still, it's, it's going to take, say, another fifty to maybe a hundred years to sort of know whether. Wynton Marsalis will be as talked about as Charlie Parker. Man, I think that is one of the most optimistic things I've heard in a long time because it assumes that 50 to 100 years <laughs> from now, we're going to be having this conversation. Yeah, still. well, let's see. Let's <laughs> see. Let's see what happens with the environment. But, you know, again, it, it's all about, you know, who's writing the history and so forth. There's so many different opinions about it. Like, I took a, a history class when I went to Peabody yeah. with uh, Martin Williams, the critic, and... You know, he's not a musician. He's a writer. He he passed away, but he was very pro Ornette Coleman. Sort of, you know, the late fifties and sixties was all about Ornette and mm -hmm. free music. John Coltrane was not important to him. Mm -hmm. McCoy Tyner was kind of a joke to him. Huh. You know, it really created a lot of controversy in the class because mm -hmm. there were a few people in the class who knew about jazz. Yeah. And we were always having arguments with him. We were just like, what do you, he was like, oh yeah, McCoy Tyner just played this, you know, kind of, it was just kind of random. It didn't make any sense. You know, it was just kind of this gimmick that he had. I was hmm. like, what are you talking about? You know? So yeah, there's, there's a lot of opinions. And, yeah. And, and, you know, getting into the whole Ken Burns thing, which might be another topic. Al Hurt may not have been controlling the dialogue around the music right, in the right, same right, way. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that Exactly. That's a big part of why we place Winton in this certain category because yeah. he's been so outspoken. Yes. And I guess he felt like he had this position uh, to uphold. And, and again, Winton Marsalis has inspired me a lot. Yeah. But on the other hand, and this is why I think it's controversial, is because that revivalism in some ways has been detrimental to the idea that jazz is a living music. Mm -hmm. Not to say that when he plays, it's not vibrant, and that when the people around him, that they're not doing something totally valid. I yeah. mean, he's an incredible trumpet player, and, you know, I, I don't, when I listen to him play, I don't necessarily think, like, I mean, there's maybe for certain things, I'm like, oh, this is a bit dated. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit gimmicky for my taste, you know, but he plays the instrument so well, and it's yes. so musical, and I do believe in the tradition to a certain extent, and I do think that every musician has a different way of acknowledging the tradition that works for them. George Colligan, acknowledging the tradition and playing the long tones. Folks, you can acknowledge the tradition by visiting third-story.com and check out the archive of interviews with musicians and other creative folks to hear how they manage these same questions. George Colligan spent years as one of the most in-demand sidemen on the New York scene. By that time, he was playing piano, but as he mentions, he started as a classical trumpet player. I love these kinds of stories, when people start out with one intention and end up somewhere else. I mean, isn't that the story of everybody's life? Here we talk about the difference between playing classical and jazz music, and then discuss how New York changed over the years, and ultimately, why he moved to Portland. For some reason, I, I always embrace that idea of like you have to you have to get your own sound, you have to do things your own way. Did you f have that feeling when you were playing classical trumpet also, or when you play classical <sighs> trumpet, you're not looking for your own sound? Absolutely not. No, that is a completely other mindset. Classical music, a lot of it is accuracy and fulfilling the needs of the composer, and mm -hmm. basically getting all the notes and getting everything that's on the page. You're not a composer when you're playing classical music. Yeah. You know, you you can inject your own sense of musicality, but there's always that kind of idea like, well, what what would Beethoven what was Beethoven's original intention? Yes. You know, that that sort of thing. And so there are people that do that really well and love they love to be a part of music that way, you know. But the reason I really gravitated towards piano was because I wanted to be a composer. I wanted to do my own stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't know why I just did. And I just thought that made more sense, you know, to me, it's just like, I just really had the desire to create music and piano seemed like the best way to do that. So the more that I did that, and even if in jazz, you're playing other people's tunes, you're still putting your own thing on it. And the fact that you have that freedom is just the gift of being a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you can do new things every night. You can't do that in life, hmm. as I found <laughs> in 47 years old, married with a job. You know, it's like there's so much of life that is like, no, this is what you're going to be doing mm -hmm. every day. You know, you you have to change these diapers every yes. day. You know, you have to take Wake out the up. trash. Yes. You have to, you know, do this and do that. But in music, why restrict yourself? And that's why creative people are drawn to jazz. But it can be tricky, though, because some people are just very, very creative. They just... Uh, they just have this natural creativity. And so then the tradition doesn't interest them as much. And so in some ways they may have a bit of a disadvantage because they don't really learn how to play changes or like how to play their instrument or whatever, you know, and they may make some great stuff, but yes. I also have a certain amount of discipline yeah. and a certain, especially now, like realizing that the more foundation you have, just the better your overall conception is yes and and again somebody like don byron ha has been inspiring to me because i think just naturally he's able to know a, a whole bunch of music and and really sort of get into like very precise transcriptions and so he has that ability but he also has a lot of creativity and, and a lot of playing with him can be very wild on the bandstand because it's like he wants there to be different stuff happening all the time you know and and he's yeah. into that so i think that's my blessing to be a jazz musician is to is to be able to have s things to study and things to always be curious about but to always have the freedom to do my own stuff as well as much as you were drawn to the piano because it allowed you to think like a composer and ultimately to find your sound also you are not only satisfied playing piano and one of the things <laughs> one of the things that i noticed after you left new york is that it seemed to me as a casual observer that you embraced these elements in your musical life that you hadn't been digging into so deeply during your 15 years here. You started playing more drums. You brought mm -hmm. the trumpet back out. Yeah. What do you think kept you from doing that more here? And what? why did you do it when you left? Well, because of the nature of New York. And this this could be a positive for not being in New York. Yeah. And this is probably why I complained about being in New York for so long, you know. So in some ways, I've gotten I've gotten my um, just desserts, I suppose. Yeah. Careful what you wish for. Ha yeah. <laughs> ha! Right. I mean, ever you know, look. I don't, were you here during nine eleven? No. Yeah. So I was here during nine yeah. eleven, and of course, I I slept through it. I flew back from Japan uh, September tenth. Wow. And so I was very jet lagged. I woke up around noon, and I looked out my window, and it was a very sunny day. Yeah. And I said, boy, it's great to be back home. Yeah. Get a good night's sleep. It's sunny. I'm going to go out and get some breakfast. Let me check my messages. <laughs> I checked my messages. My wife was my girlfriend then. She she worked down there. She was like, oh, my God, planes have been hijacked to the World Trade Center. Blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm walking home over the Brooklyn Bridge. And then my mother was looking for me. Sure. You know, oh, I was like. Am I still asleep? <laughs> yeah. Is this jet lag or what? Yeah. So I, I just, I said I can't even process it. So I just walked outside, went to get breakfast. You did. And and then I saw this lady in the building that I knew, and she, we started talking about, it and she was just talking about whatever the cause, the possible causes and effects of geopolitical politics, blah blah blah. I was just like whatever. But you know, but then once I had the chance to process it, you know, and that was a very traumatic time. It was because everybody thought like. What's next? Yes. You know what I mean? From that point on, I was sort of like trying to figure out how to get out of New York because I thought like if there's going to be a terrorist attack, it's going to be here. The The work thing changed as well. Like before 9-11, I had so much work. I mean, it was just insane. Huh. Like I wonder if I ever if could find the calendar. Yeah. Like May of 2001, I probably worked with like 30 different bands. Mm. It was insane. I mean, I, that month I had like gig with Ralph Peterson, a mm -hmm. gig with Terrell Stafford, a gig with Don, you know, just with John Gordon. Every, every, like just May of 2001, that was, that was the like top. the peak of my career at that, <laughs> of my sideman career at that point. You know, gigs with Lonnie Plaxico, whatever. Just thinking it would go on forever. And it just, it just seemed to really 
gets slower and slower after that. It just was never, never the same. So I just started to think like, especially for the long term, you know, and this is why a lot of people pursue teaching or they pursue some other type of living situation. Mm -hmm. So you embraced your diversity. You right. don't settle into one thing, but New York sort of forced you to, to yeah I into think it. because you kind of have to specialize yeah. when you're here a bit um, because it's so competitive I mean mm. I, I enjoy playing drums but there are so many good drummers here as you know and and you know I've been trying to play bass a little bit mm. bass players in New York oh my god there's so many bass players it's insane they're all killing you know it's hard to find a bad bass player in New York I read something that you wrote on your blog a couple years ago where you said every city has its elders who are influential but in New York they would likely recede into the crowd of one be one of many mm -hmm. I think some in some cases it, you're much better off being an influential elder in a community where you can really have an impact on people's lives and on the community than being one of many in a scene that's, well, that's saturated well here's the thing is like one of the reasons I think New York is the way it is is not just because it's a mecca, just also because there isn't anything happening anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So there was a time when like you could stay where you lived and make a living mm -hmm. and and it wasn't some people just didn't want to go to New York, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they but they could still be active musically and they could still not not feel like, "Oh, I didn't go to New York, so I failed or something." Sure. It was just like, "Well, I just chose to stay where where I was and yeah. I made something happen there." Yeah. Like Philadelphia, for example. Absolutely. Victor Bailey told me that his father, who's a musician, um he used to brag about the fact that there were 75 places to play in Philly. This is obviously many years ago. Yes. But um Sure, and I think that there, as a rhythm section player too, there were opportunities to to do pickup gigs with mm -hmm. people as they traveled. And yeah, sure. There's some guys in Portland who always talk about like they played with Joe Henderson when mm -hmm. he would come through. Sure. So yeah, so so being in Portland, um, in some ways, there is a way to thrive there because mm -hmm. I'm not part of the crowd necessarily. You know, um, I wouldn't say I've established myself, but like I kind of have a position where. If it, it's a little bit easier to just do stuff, do things I want to do. Yeah, I don't think that the city has. I mean, like whatever this, the jazz scene has totally embraced me yet, but they're on the verge. I think <laughs> you know, but that's not really what's important to me. The important thing is like I feel like I can do stuff and I can hire students and I can give them opportunities that that are different from just going to class. You know, it's kind of funny to say the city hasn't embraced me, but they're on the verge. I mean, what do you think they want? They want you to be a, a serious and singularly focused. Well, here's the thing, thing about Portland. If if and I hope I don't offend any Portlanders, but I probably will because <laughs> Portlanders are easily offended <laughs> We're, because they're so sensitive. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, the New York attitude is sort of there's a you you have to have and I, I'm sensitive too but yeah. you have to develop some kind of a thick skin to be here you know what I mean mm -hmm. I was trying to get on the subway yesterday and rush hour is really crowded and this old lady like I, I couldn't decide where I was going this yeah. old this old lady pushed me yeah <laughs> oh sure and you know what it didn't even bother me yeah. I was just like well she was yeah. she needed to get where she's going i'm trying to get where i'm going yep. you know in portland uh it's just it's the west coast you know it's and it's a very it's like a it's like a large town almost yeah. you know so um just very very provincial in a way and what i found is it's hard to be critical of something you don't like you know say well i don't like this about portland like what are you talking about it's so wonderful here you mm -hmm. know with the mountains and you know the outdoors and this is America. We are allowed to complain, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it, just because I complain doesn't mean that I hate everything about the city. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like I'm making a comment. So maybe we can get better. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I feel like in New York, you have the right you, with all the rent you're paying. You have the right to complain about whatever you want. You know, everybody, uh, even people who will acknowledge that it's the greatest city in the world. They're still going to complain about something, you know. But so I think also in Portland, it's it's almost like a resistance to anything new. Yeah, they sort of have their musicians that have lived there forever, and so that's kind of all they know. So, unfortunately, like me coming in up, uh, upsets that balance. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people just don't 
want to take in any new information. They're kind of like, well, I know these guys are, th- these are the guys in Portland. It's like, well, I just moved here. I'm good too. Yeah. I'm a guy, <laughs> so, so I'm a guy in Portland. Now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, of course then the opposite is p- then people say like, Oh, you're from Portland. I'm like, no, I'm not from right. Portland. There, and there's probably some, some combination, some balance of these things. You know, one thing is you move to a place, a Portland, a Chicago, a Minneapolis, a Philadelphia, whatever it is, and become a, an entrenched member of that community. Right. The other is you set up shop there. You live there. You have your teaching gig and your kind of performing life. Uh, can happen outside of Portland. Yeah. But what I've seen a little bit in social media or whatever is that you sort of have it, are having it both ways because you're out here playing Mesro and Smalls mm-hmm. under your more usual yeah. persona. Mm-hmm. And when you're there, I see you putting projects together that really don't look anything like what you were doing when you lived here. Right. That's true. And that's the advantage is like, yeah. I mean, here it's just tough. You know, it's tough yeah. to, to get bookings, you know. Um, Did you ever sing when you lived in New York? No, no, never, never. And I heard this record that you made where you're playing everything and singing everything. In a way, it's, it sounds to me like the sort of culmination of everything that you do. When I heard it, I, I was surprised that, that actually you hadn't done it sooner because, I mean, you play all these instruments. It's a record where you play drums and right. piano mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. organ and trumpet and sing. And it's sort of like this real essential piece of you, it seems like. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for listening to it. <laughs> now I know one person listened to it. Lyrically, it's very out, too, because yeah. it's like musically, it's kind of serious. And then the, some of the lyrics are like, I would fix the world, but I don't have the time. Right. You know? Oh, wow. You really checked it out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So uh, let me just tell you how that record came about. Yeah. Uh, back when I was teaching in Winnipeg, mm-hmm. you know, I was in Winnipeg for two years at the University of Manitoba. And, you know, for a long time, I'd sort of had ideas of. Um, writing songs. My wife, Carrie Pollitzer, she did a singer-songwriter record, which is really, really nice. Mm-hmm. I played drums on that, and, and she just c- took some songwriting classes and, and um, took vocal lessons, and she mm-hmm. did she did something really, really good. Um, she hasn't done it lately because she's too busy with the kids and s- sort of felt a little bit, you know, like, oh, it's a lot of effort to do that, you know, yeah. whatever, but she really has a, has, has a natural feeling for that. Um, so I was I was somewhat inspired by her, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, again, I was busy and whatever. Just never really got around to it. Didn't have the equipment that I needed, whatever. So then, when we were in Winnipeg, the way it came about is there's a place called uh, Aqua Books. The guy who ran Aqua Books asked me to be. He said, "Hey, we do this thing here at Aqua Books where we have a songwriter in residence. Mm-hmm. Do you want to do you want to do that just to say you're you know I can even give you a little office here if you want to write in you know and." Do you want to do that? I was like, well, I'm not really a songwriter. I'm more of a composer. He's mm-hmm. like, well, do you want to do it or not? Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, I'll do it. I'll be the songwriter in residence. So, so then I sort of thought, well, maybe this is a signal that I should start writing songs, mm-hmm. you know. And my wife had decided to stay in New York for an extra month or so because mm-hmm. it's very cold in Winnipeg, and she was just like, she didn't like Winnipeg really at all. So, but so I was alone for a month. You know, I was teaching, but in the I, winter, yeah, but basically an empty, empty apartment. And so I decided to start writing lyrics and, and, you know, started recording some stuff. And I mean, my vocals were really, I mean, I had to take lessons. I'm not much of a vocalist, but back then it was, it was embarrassing. It was, I couldn't, couldn't really hold pitch. I was like, well, singing is hard, (laughs) you know, and uh, I just had no idea. So um, I would record demos that's really the process was more it wasn't so much writing as it was like kind of like coming up with chords and then having the lyrics and sort of just kind of freely working it out vocally rather than writing notes like I would with with uh, instrumental composition and that just seemed really organic you yeah. know and um I do know that lyrics you can connect with people easier than like, oh, this is a hip chord, whatever. But in terms of lyrical content, which again, it was a new, yeah. uh, except for, I tried to, I tried to write raps in the eighties. I, I did a few like little mixtapes of my own that I, that we'd play on the bus and, <laughs> yeah. and people would be like, who is this? This is you? You know, I did write the Centennial High School fight song that I won $25 in a competition. That was really my only at- attempts at lyrics. But other than that, like I had never really done it. So once I started, I was just sort of like, well, I want it to be, I want to write things that are meaningful and that have a higher purpose. So, you know, that's, that's why some of those songs are the way that they are. And I don't know, I thought it was going to go somewhere, but you know, like anything, you got to have somebody behind it. And I, I never figured out how to get somebody to help me 
push that project. So I'm, I'm kind of leaving it alone for now. Sure. Not to say that I won't do it in the future. Yeah. It is somewhat a vanity project. George Colligan writing meaningful lyrics. I'm a huge comedy fan, and so many musicians I know also love comedy. There's some shared experience between the music life and the comedy life, the relationship between preparation and improvisation, and the connection to an audience. But there's also a world of difference. George Colligan really explored that when he dipped his toe into the holy waters of stand-up and started doing sets around town in New York. Here he talks about that experience, how jazz and comedy are related, and how they're different. Essential to the experience of doing comedy is bombing. Going through a period of terrible failure on stage. It seems like everyone who ever tried it tells the same story. And the way George frames it is eye-opening. One of the things I thought when I heard you sing and heard your lyrical approach, you know, when you sing and you write lyrics, you kind of have to develop an identity, a point of view. And I know that you've spent a little bit of time exploring stand-up comedy also, (laughs) which is another kind of discipline in which you have to find a version of yourself to present and right. one that people want to hear from. Well, let me just say this, that I I mean, I don't think people think of me in comedic terms necessarily, but like I definitely have a, a sense of humor yeah. that's influenced by my father who had a great sense of humor. He was from Brooklyn. Uh-huh. He knew a lot of jokes and always like to laugh, you know. In fact, I mean, my my family, we were kind of known as people who laughed. And he and my sister, I remember I used to play trumpet in the some of the the, the musical productions at, at uh, Centennial High School. And, mm-hmm. you know, anytime there was a joke on stage, I could I could hear my father and, and sister laughing in the audience, you know what I mean? And and he had some comedy records, you know, and he liked to we liked to sit around and listen to comedy and, and I've sort of developed an appreciation for comedy of all types, you know, a broad spectrum. There are so many comparisons to music, especially to jazz music, in the way you develop your material and the way you present it to the audience, you know. Um jazz and comedy you prepare a lot. There's a lot of time spent developing a lot of ideas, you know, but you're presenting it to the audience as if you're coming up with it for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's that illusion of spontaneity, you know, and some of it is real spontaneity and some of it might be technically less, but comedians, they prepare for years. I mean, it takes, you know, I think there's this. Lenny Bruce said at one point on a very good night, he might do five to eight percent you know, improvised. Right. Mm-hmm. It's right. very difficult to improvise on a stage. Yeah. I saw Louis C.K. at Caroline's, mm-hmm. and it gave me the fa- the same feeling as when I saw Joe Henderson live. Wow, this is this is somebody who's really at the top of their game. They just, it's effortless. Yes. You know what I mean? So he's somebody, <laughs> he spent 25 years yeah. honing his, but you know, people people have this idea, and, and uh, Larry David talked about this when he went to stand-up comedy for the first time. He went up to the MC. He was like, can I go up? Well, who are you? He's like, well, I'm not I'm not a comedian, but I, I, I think I can do this. Yeah. No, you can't. <laughs> and he learned as he got up on stage, he's like, oh, I can't. I can't do this. So did you bomb? I, t- I took a class. I took a uh-huh. class through Caroline's. And so definitely in the class, I bombed. The first assignment was to come up with two minutes of material. And, so, you know, and again, getting into the, like, the reasons I got into jazz, because I was a composer. I wanted to be a composer. And so the idea of writing your own jokes is just fascinating to me. You know what I mean? It's like if you come up with, and even if you could write one joke, even if you get one joke that works, mm-hmm. it's like, it's incredible, mm-hmm. you know? And that's the f- same feeling I had when I wrote tunes. And I was like, hey, this is something I can play tonight. I wrote this. It didn't exist before. You know, so the idea that you can come up with s- new material or your own material and, and deliver it, I mean, to me, was just great. Now, so the first time I did two minutes in the class, I don't think I, maybe I got one titter of laughter, you know. But other than that, it, when when you have material that doesn't work, two minutes I mean, it was in a classroom, but still, it's like, it's like, you know, like they just took your pants off or something, you know, it's like, it's, it's humiliating. Yes. It's like, oh, like, it's like a dagger in your heart, you know, it's like, wow, this is really something. So that was where I bombed the first time. And then every time I got up in class, it got better. It definitely got better, you know. Did you have to 
find your quote unquote voice as a comedian in the same way you had to find it as a player or a writer? I didn't do it long enough, I think, to find my own voice, but I do. I'm still getting there. I've been really wanting to do it now that I'm in Portland and yeah. I'm taking a sabbatical and maybe that's one of the things uh-huh. I'm going to try to do is at least go to some open mics and, you know, cause I still have a lot of ideas. Um, but when people say, Oh, I need to write, you know, it's the same thing as composing, you know, you need to kind of sit there and, and work it and hash it out, you know? So anyway, so I did, I did the class and then I did a performance at Caroline's and, you know, it's funny because a lot of musicians showed up. They yeah. heard through the grapevine that I was doing this show. So, like, Ravi Coltrane was there, <laughs> David Gilmore, the guitar player. <laughs> Mike Kanan was there uh-huh. and all these people. And I remember Mike Kanan, Mike Kanan came up to me. He was just like, man, you got balls. Yeah. You got balls to do that. Now, it wasn't great, but it was a way. It was so much better than I expected. And also because the guy who went on before me was so different from me. Yeah. It was like he was a more experienced comic, and then clearly I was just starting. You know, I was just like, I don't know why I'm on after this guy, but you know, and then so that became part of the joke. It it was not bad. And it was were really you not a, bad. were you a jazz musician? I mean, is that part of the material that you? That I, you I think used? I mentioned I mentioned something about that, like oh, you know, I, I'm a musician, but I, I did decide to get into comedy to have yeah. something to fall back on, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. Cause the problem with jazz and, you know, I'm not just going to get up and tell jokes about Joe Henderson. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> those are so non-universal, which is a shame because Some musicians are stuff. funny. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, if you've ever read um, jazz anecdotes mm-hmm. by Bill Crow, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there. You know, there's so many great stories about musicians, you know, but, but they I, don't necessarily translate outside of the no, universe. They, often they don't. But I, I just didn't do it enough, you know, because I, I did maybe a handful of performances, a handful of open mics. It was a, a, a great experience. I remember I went to an open mic at Stand Up New York, mm-hmm. which is like um, Upper East Side, I think. That was my first time going to a real New York open mic. Yep. Oh, man. Just the, the people in there. I mean... It's dark. I mean, being there, there's so many comedians in New York. It's like I mean, drummers. Yeah, it's, it kind of. It <laughs> is. Know? It is. There were probably 30 comics there, you know. I mean, you know, I went to Caroline's the other night yeah. to hear a, a sort of new comics thing. Oh, so many. The show was at least two hours. Everybody gets five minutes, you know. Wow. And, and the thing is, those open mics... The audience is all the comedians. They're not listening to you. They're trying to think about what they're going to say. It's the practice. It's like jam. It's a jam. It's session. like a jam session. Yes, it's exactly like the jam session. So uh, it's a kind of a different level of uh, yeah. etiquette. It was a great experience while it was going on, but like my life is a little bit different now. And but I I, I really appreciate the art form. How, how is it different from playing music, playing jazz? Well, because it's just you. I mean, unless you do solo, I, I don't do a lot of solo piano performances, you know, but I think because it is just you, obviously, I mean, jazz is somewhat of a niche audience, you know, comedy. I don't think there's anybody who would say like, oh, I don't like comedy. You know what I mean? Like, but it just depends on what kind of humor they like, yes. you know? And for me, it's just like with music. I mean, I know I said that a lot of today's stuff I'm not a fan of, but I'll give anything a chance. Sure. So with comedians, I feel like I'd at least like to know about, you know, like I I have XM radio, so I listen to a lot of different types of comedians. You know, some some I like more than others, but but um, I mean, even somebody like um, you might be a redneck, Jeff Foxworthy. Foxworthy. Yeah, Jeff Foxworthy. He's somebody that I figured I just wouldn't like. Yeah. You know, and some of that speaks to my prejudice of you know, what I associate people who have that sort of, obviously if his, his audience was, was rednecks, yeah. you know, and, and especially in today's political climate, you know, it's obviously I have issues with that, you know, yes. but I listened to him a bunch and I'm like, you know, he's no different than anyone else. Yep. It's this, and, and I watched a documentary where he talks about, he's like, this is how comedy works. You have set up, punchline set up punchline you know what i mean and it's like every kind of 15 to 30 seconds you know and this is just you know i think about that sometimes too you know i i was thinking today not in terms of comedy but in terms of a big part of the work that i do is writing music for tv commercials and music for industrial film and all kinds of stuff you know and i watched what i was doing and there was definitely craft and skill involved 
creativity also. I don't know how much talent was involved in what I was doing to this morning, you know? And and I first I got in my head and I thought, well, so are there people more talented doing this or should I, be, you know, am I not? Is, I just started questioning myself. And then I thought, you know, but sometimes even in the creative arts or the create in the field of creativity, you just are doing it because you know how to do it. You've done it. You have the you learn the craft of it. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be a creative genius every time you Absolutely. sit down. Absolutely. Sometimes yeah. it's a functional thing. And even in writing a joke. Yeah. I mean, Louis C.K. is obviously a kind of genius, but he also is a, a craftsman. I mean, there's a craft in what you do and the more you do it the more automatic it becomes. Well, again, think about the fact that, because we see him, we only see the finished product. Right. We see him get up, you're like, how does he do that? Yeah. He spent 25 years. Yeah. I don't think he went to college. He yeah. just, you know, came out and started doing it, you know? Yeah. And again, there is that skill. It, a lot, so much of it is skill. Yeah. And I think this whole, yeah, it, we do, I mean, I have the same thing. I say so-and-so is a genius, yeah. so-and-so is a genius. But I think that, it's dangerous to think that way in our society now, especially for young people, because they, I mean, even Louis C.K. talks yeah. about how they throw that word around. Like yeah. he's like, uh, what does he say? Uh, well, I, I brought some cups in case we need cups. Dude, you're a genius. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, that kind of thing. You know, right. it's like, really? Yeah. So, but, but especially for young people who yeah. just the way that they, see life you know everything is on your phone and the access to information the access to awareness is so easy and they take it for granted and so they don't see the process for anything Mm -hmm. they don't understand like we as older people we say like oh well we remember when there was just phones Mm -hmm. and, and then you had I mean, just right. cell, ph- sure. cell phones was a new thing, and then yeah. computers were a new yeah. thing, and like just any kind of progression of society, being able to have a perspective, being able to look back, yes, you know, and they can't, they don't do that, so they just everything is instantaneous, and everybody wants to be rich, they want to be on American Idol, and they want to be, I don't even know if that show's still on, but like they want, it, they want just everything to be instantaneous. They're like, I want to be discovered, yeah. I want to be, I want to be a star, you know, and it's like you, that's the worst attitude so in that sense they feel like because you set them up for failure because they're like either i'm talented and i'm discovered and if i'm not oh forget it i'm just gonna give up and whatever and that's not the attitude it's like you have to see everything as a process so i see my musical life as a process i mean if i were to have stayed in stand-up comedy in order to survive you have to see everything as a process you know it's a shame because the last time i performed stand-up comedy in new york was again at caroline's Mm -hmm. and i did bomb i bombed pretty hard there were people from new jersey heckling me and it was pretty rough but again you you read interviews you see interviews with comedians they're all talking about you have to bomb and it's the same way in music and i think it's the same way in life like you have to have bad experiences and a lot of young people just don't want to ever have a bad moment in their life. What I hear you saying is, you know, people are trying to protect themselves from failure. Yes. And in protecting themselves from failure, they also kind of anesthetize themselves to yes. any r- real feeling Absolutely. or connection with life. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's not a good way to live yeah. because you're just going to be more miserable than right. you should be. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And, and that's, I mean, again, I'm 47. Yeah. I think for people who aren't creative, they sort of think of 47 as like a place where you should be totally secure. You have a job, you have a house, everything is sort of is set. But on paper, you are that. You do have a job for life if you want it. Yeah, it's true. But I don't, I mean, maybe this is my problem. It's like, I don't see it that way. I see hopefully more time to, I I still want to develop musically. You know what I mean? Somebody might come to see me tonight at smalls or whatever and say like oh he's so great and it's like well yeah but this is only one moment in time and like i still have a lot of aspirations musically some professionally but but musically as well like there's so much music out there and there's so much that i haven't done right now if you had a name of aspiration musically that you haven't done is there something on the top of the list oh i bet you want to know what's on the top of that list We'll hear George Colligan's deepest desires in a moment for our final segment. But first, the aristocrats. 
I like how George frames bombing. It's the same in comedy, music, and in life. Failure is a necessary device for maturity. Without the possibility of failure, there is no possibility of success. That's an idea that comes up again and again in these third story podcast conversations. It certainly came up with singer Becca Stevens, whose beautiful new album, Regina, just came out, and you should check that out. I remember she wrote that phrase down on a napkin while we were talking and she Instagrammed it. But over and over, in last week's conversation with Ryan Groose, he compares starting his business to a baby bird jumping out of the nest. It's at the core of the creative experience and I encourage you to check out the archive to hear the journeys and struggles of all these brilliant people. Third-story.com is where you want to go or iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Mixcloud will get you fixed up too. And now for George Colligan's wish list, as well as a final analysis of why playing trumpet is so unforgiving, why he and drummer Jack DeJanet have such a beautiful and strong connection together, why drummers should think less about chops and more about the feeling, and what it means to be a sideman. Stick around, my friends, and when it's all over, don't fret, because I'll be back next week with another great conversation. Really, the main thing is I want to do more of my own stuff. Yeah. That's the main goal right now, is is to pursue that as and that's it's been difficult well and we but we didn't talk about this about how your life in new york so much of it was as the side manniest working yes cat i mean you played in a lot of people's bands and a lot of projects a lot of people's records and yes established yourself as like a really top call side man yeah and it's very hard i imagine under those circumstances to do your own thing at the same time. Well, the thing is, I think that the nature of how you come up in this business has changed. Like, I believe that there was a time, and this is what I was told. I think Steve Coleman told me this when I went to Banff in 1990. He was like, you know, you basically, you work your way up. You become a side man, and then eventually people start to see you as a leader. And then you then you pursue that. Um, but now it's sort of changed because you almost have to not be a side man to be a leader. You know what I mean? So you have people who they hmm. sort of decided early or for whatever circumstance. Personality. They, or yeah, whatever. they just never were in demand like that. So they said, well, I'm just going to do it myself. And mm-hmm. they've had a lot more success than I have because they dedicated themselves to do it. And they only did that. I mean, this isn't exactly the kind of example, but somebody like Dave Holland, who mm-hmm. who was a great side. Sure. Man, but when he decided to be a leader, he kind of stopped being a side man as much you know he said i really need to focus on this and he took a lot of losses but he dedicated himself to it and now he's in a place where he can do it whenever he wants he's one of the top demand acts in demand you know he everybody knows dave holland you know for me it's like you know in a way like some of the venues i've played are too big for me to develop like some of the places i play with dejanet for example yeah it's like they're I can't go in there. I'm just, I don't have that kind of name. But then some of the clubs might not know me. You know what I mean? So that Because you're not working the clubs. You're working right, in the theater with Dijon. Right, I'm theater. Yeah, so that's... Oh, so you're in a little bit of a middle ground, no man's land. In a way. In a way. That's what I'm sort of gathering now. Yeah. But um, the thing about being a sideman and leadership in the traditional way, I think, I mean, I have talked to quite a few people who talk about how they learn to be leaders by being sidemen, you know, that you, because you work with different kinds of leaders and you see different styles and what works and, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I would say a lot of what I've learned has been from the people, the people that I work with who work with Miles, Mm -hmm. like Gary Bartz, Gary Thomas, Buster Williams, Lenny White. Not so much Lenny. Lenny is a little bit different. Jack, of course. um, But, and do they have a similar approach, all, all of them? Their approach is kind of like, well, if they call you, they know that there's something you do that, that they want in their in their music. So it's not necessarily going to be a lot of like, you know, do this, do that. Like there's a guitar player who, again, will remain nameless, who I did one gig with, and it was so controlled. Not to say, again, I, I'm flexible. So if somebody wants to be very controlling, I will do my best yeah. to make it work, you know, as a professional. I'm like, well, what do you want? You know, um, a lot of vocalists tend to sure. be a little bit more that way, you know, just by the nature of the beast. You know, I'm not going to be like, I refuse. You know, I, I'm, I mean, to this day, I'm like, well, what's, let's make it work, you know. But all the people I mentioned, um, they, 
sort of just let I mean, especially Jack. Jack barely ever says anything. The most you're going to get from him is like, yeah, guys, that was cool. You know, like he, <laughs> he gives you the music, you go over it, and then that's it. You know, and, and it's sort of like, let's let's talk through the music rather than like, well, I want you to play 16th notes here. And, you know, I mean, for some people that works, you know, to be, to, they, they need that. Like, and in a sense, somebody like that, they should play all the instruments so yeah. that they can just play it all themselves. Or, you know? or call the kinds of people that thrive in a highly directed environment. Right. You know, mm-hmm. something about you and Jack, I think is interesting is that he's a piano player. Yes. And you're a drummer. Yes. You know, you really both have a lot of empathy for one oh, another. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's interesting because I feel like I play, I play piano more like a drummer. Yes. You know, and he plays piano like a pianist Uh uh-huh he's a very very light touch and he but i think he plays drums with a very pianistic approach yes very melodic approach. yes absolutely absolutely yeah he he, i don't think he even thinks of himself as a drummer in a way it's sort of like i just play music on the drums yeah i think for both of us it's we don't see the instrument it's just more of like the person Mm -hmm. you know the the musical it, it could be any instrument i mean jack picked up my trumpet one time and He's not a trumpet player, but somehow he sounded good, you know? I heard he plays bass. I think he plays bass pretty well. Like, he's just a musical guy. Like, yeah. scat singing. Like, he's just full of music, you yeah. know? And and that just comes across always, you know? I went to his house. He's in his basement. He's got a little practice studio. He had just some drums set up. Just basic, just a snare, uh, yeah. kick, ride, hi-hat. And then he's got keyboards, so, like, you know, we we're kind of messing around. I, so I got on the drums and and he got on the keyboard and we just jammed on like giant steps for a good twenty minutes. You yeah. know, and it's just the same feeling as as I as I feel happens with with his drumming. It's yeah. it, it's like it could go on forever. It's never like oh this is getting boring. Yeah. Like it just seems like this endless flow. You know, rhythmically and idea wise, and it'd be great to do something like that. Where we switched around, yeah. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but you know. well, you know, I like you talk about the simpatico. You are obviously also somebody who is, you know, in tune to music at all times and <laughs> in, in different spaces and different ways. And I can see how you guys connect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, when you come out here, do you uh, when you travel? I mean, do you take your trumpet with you? Do you try to put the trumpet in your mouth? That's a hard instrument to maintain. <sighs> I, I was, I really was. I haven't been doing it lately. I'm good for about one song, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, I definitely don't shed like I did in college. Yeah. You know, I was shedding all the time. How can you possibly? It's impossible. In order to be a, a really competent, professional, working trumpet player, you have to minimum an hour, uh, t- yeah. two, I'd say even two. You need to have two hours a day every day. Yeah, it seems more punishing than any other instrument. Well, it's it's not forgiving because yeah. if you miss a day, two days, forget it. You know, if if you're really professional, if yeah. you want to be like now, I'm sort of at the point. I have my mouthpiece in uh-huh. my bag where I'm staying, and and I could probably play a couple choruses on a horn yeah. if I had to, but I can't do a gig. There's no way. Yeah. So I consider trumpet now more of a hobby. Mm-hmm. It's more fun to have it like that because there's no pressure. I was very self conscious about my playing in college, and and um, took it very seriously, and. I feel that way about my drumming, man. Really? I mean, yeah, because I don't work as a drummer. It's, I mean, I, that's I work with my dad as a drummer, and I play on my recordings as a drummer. And I, but I don't define myself in that way any anymore, like I did. And I've lost all of my issues that <laughs> yeah. I had with it. You know, I just love it when I play. It just feels great to play, and I don't. I'm not in my head judging it. You know? Well, in a way, that is the best place to be, and yeah. that's how you should be with everything. Yeah. You know, and that's part of the process that's where you're at in your life yeah that's where i'm at in my life you know yeah man so i think uh a, a lot of people so much of it is about the chops yeah in a way the more you're focusing on the chops the less you're focusing on the music mm-hmm. and obviously there's a certain amount of facility you need to have but in some ways the less the less you focus on that the more you can make music that's meaningful you know what i mean rather than like oh man i have all these licks in all 12 keys and everything and stuff and i've definitely done my time with that but 
when I'm <laughs> playing in the moment, it's not about it's not about that. It's about the musical connection. Yeah, and I think you can have a lot of musical connection without the most chops. Yes, the thing that you said about Jack was not you know chops for days. You said which he and he does have chops all over the place. But you you know you said he's listening. Yeah, he needs communicating. Yeah, which I think is like a a very high art. And it's a hard thing to study. It's all about the context. Yeah. With anything, I was telling, I did a master class yeah. yesterday at Queens College, and I was talking about that. I was like, it's saying to this drummer, this young drummer, I said, it's great that you can do all this stuff, but the whole point is when. And I think that you were really, you wanted to get your stuff out. Yeah. It. We weren't, you weren't really trying to make this work, you know. Yeah. And he said, yeah, I know, that's one of my problems, you know. Billy Higgins. All Not a day. chops meister. How many records is he on? Oh man. Well, you know, my dad always said that jazz is, is an art form that encourages simplicity over time. That over time, you strip away a uh, lot of yeah. the artifice, and you're left with this essential part of yourself. When we're young, we have this desire to be impressive. You know, uh, as you get older, you just don't care. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're sort of like, this is how I play. What are you gonna do? You know. Yeah. So, so that's where the maturity comes in. That's interesting because I heard a, a band recently, all highest level players, the, the highest level, yeah. you know, very mature. There's a lot of maturity. Sometimes I felt like there was a bit of passion missing. Mm-hmm. And that's something I never want. I never want to lose that passionate element. But I yeah. think it's sort of two different things. I think for me, being passionate and being impressive, that's that's different. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm not trying to show off. Yeah. I'm trying to like be very expressive you know yeah. and if i hope it doesn't come off as being show off you know there's certain players where you just know it, it does become so ego yeah like oh this guy's just trying to show us he's the best technician in the world you know hey man I, you know you don't seem show offy to me at all thank you you <laughs> you seem very much in the present and thanks for spending a little time with me today oh my pleasure let's do it again sometime i would love to <laughs> Joke. What? Knock knock. Who's there? Soup. Soup who? Oh, you got some soup in your face? <laughs> That's the joke. Okay, I have a different one. Knock knock. Who's there? Soup. Soup who? Soup for you. <laughs> That's the joke? Wait, you have another one? I can eat the... Um... <laughs> what do you might think.